So we're in your United States history book. We're in chapter 27 in the last section, and now we're going to focus on the Middle East. We're going through the time of the Cold War, and we went um, from not only from, you know, what was going on in the United States, what was going on in, in uh, um, Europe, what was going on in Asia, going on to the Latin America and Africa, and now we're going to focus on um, all kinds of unrest that's going on in the Middle East. So we're going into the Suez Canal crisis, the conflicts with Israel, which were the Six Day War, the Yom Kippur War, onto the Camp David Accords, trouble in Lebanon, OPEC, oil crisis, and onto the Iran hostage crisis. So here's some pictures of all these. The pictures is actually the Six Day War and um, the Jews looking up as they um, uh, conquered and had overtook Jerusalem. And they're looking now to Jerusalem. A sweet picture there. And here's um, Israel becoming a nation, having to fight right after becoming a nation for, for their um, independence there from the Arab, surrounded Arab nations. And so, and then we have the hostage crisis and that's, we're gonna end with that before we get into the next, um, the next section which will have to do with the presidency, presidency of Ronald Reagan. So let's begin. The Eisenhower Doctrine. So what's the Eisenhower Doctrine? Well, both the Soviet Union and the United States sought to gain access to the rich oil fields in the Middle East. They all wanted oil, right? Several military conflicts broke out. The Middle East became a hotbed of Cold War foreign policy. Congress adopted the Eisenhower Doctrine, which gave the president power to use force against communism aggression in the Middle East. So they appropriated $200 million for economic and military help to the Arab world. So in the midst of all this, we have the Eisenhower Doctrine saying, now we're going to defend, this is what it is, the Eisenhower Doctrine, we're going to defend the Middle East, any, any um, country in the Middle East that's attacked by a communist country or influenced by a communist country. So the Eisenhower doctors basically said, we're gonna stand up against communists in the Middle East. So it says Middle Eastern countries could request United States economic and military support if threatened, if threatened, especially if they're threatened by communism. So Eisenhower doctrine. First crisis we have is the Suez Canal crisis under Nasser, the Nasser Aswan project. So what's that? It's a dam, it's the Aswan Dam. In 1956, Egyptian President Gamil Abdel Nasser, um, he lived 1918 to 1970, supported terrorist groups that frequently raided Israel, Israeli settlements. So he was not Let's just say he's Egyptian. He's not a friend of Israel at all, basically wanting Israel to perish. He tried to build Egypt into a major Arab power and soon possessed a huge army. He claimed to be peaceful and sought money from the United States for his Aswan High Dam project on the Nile River, but also cultivated favor with communist countries. The United States, after learning this, canceled participation in the Aswan project in July of 1956. Nasser's reaction was to seize British and French assets and to nationalize the Suez Company, the Suez Canal Company. So his big deal, number one, he's anti-Israel all the way. You can see here, he is actually, you know, um, having you know, parties and, you know, friendships, shaking hands with Israeli um, Palestinians and such um, as Israeli um, enemies. And here we see he's, you know, he's budding up to, who's this guy here? Fidel Castro, communist. Here he's budding up to Khrushchev, you know, the, the communist leader in um, Soviet Union. So you see his He's like, okay, I'm going to pal up with whoever. And he, he tried to, you know, be, um, do that, be, have peace with the United States because he wanted our money because he wanted to control the Aswan Dam here, as put, bringing this big dam into Egypt 
So um, basically, which would be uh, would be a, a great project, but his project in doing this, he was gaining, trying to gain support from wherever he could. Let's just say that. So the Suez Canal, we have the Suez Canal and this canal is very important for the whole world because the canal was used by um, all, all different countries um, to go through the canal so they wouldn't have to go all the way around, you know, um, the continent of Africa, right? They can just go through the canal and they'd be into the Mediterranean Sea. So the UN was pending to intervene in what was going on um, with his dam and what he was thinking about doing in the Suez Canal. Israel suddenly then invaded Egypt in October, responding to terrorist violence and to Nasser's declaration that Israeli ships were banned from the canal. So here's the Suez Canal and because he's anti-Israel, he's basically saying no Israeli ships are gonna be able to come through the Suez Canal anymore, so they can't, they can't, they're in the Mediterranean, they can't get to the Mediterranean Sea. And so Israel comes in and actually, you know, um, um, bombs, you know, uh, 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 responds to the violence by um, um, bombing. So we have, um, in the midst of this, Israel invades, or I should say invades, I shouldn't say bomb with bombs, but invades. So then Britain and France responded by sending planes and troops now to seize the canal, realizing, guess what? Um, Nasser's going to actually take over the canal now and will, will not let um, Britain and France come either if they're not letting Israel. And so Egypt began using ships then to block the canal, and the uh, Syrian Arabs destroyed the oil pipelines there. So now we have a whole crisis going in the Suez Canal. We have not only that, we have this, the Arabs coming in with the, um, blocking the oil there and Nasser, you know, saying taking over the Suez Canal. So what's going to happen next? So the Soviet Union then threatened to intervene on behalf of Egypt against the British and the French and against Israel. So the Soviet Union, Russia stands up and say, OK, we're on Nasser's side. You know, if you're going to come in and you're going to start bombing Egypt or you're going to come back and you're going to start a war in Egypt, we're going to fight on the side of Egypt. So under this pressure of the United States, the United Nations, of course, at that time, um, basically um, with those three invaded nations, told them to withdraw their troops. So the United Nations says, uh, basically said, Israel, France, uh, British, the Britain, Britain, you need to withdraw your troops and not invade. So an uneasy ceasefire prevailed as this 10 nations, 10 nations, and the UN at that time only had 10 nations. They had an uh, emergency force. They arrived to police the area and to keep peace and supervise the clearing of the canal. So now the United Nations is trying to come in with the Suez Canal stopping this crisis as much as they could and trying to police it in the midst of Nasser. Of course, now he's um, um, shown his communist um, ties in the midst of all this in Egypt. But conflicts with Israel would go on. Of course, we start. We have to start with Israel on May 14th, 1948. Israel became a nation, and that was a miracle. And the United States and Great Britain helped sponsor the establishment of the state of Israel as a haven for Jews around the world. So with the memory of the Holocaust that happened in Germany, right, that happened um, uh, uh, during World War II, um, that was fresh in their minds, the Jewish survivors there um, began to build an army to protect herself from hostile Arab 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 neighbors. So Israel starts quickly um, putting an army together and pretty much of a ragtag army, you know, in the midst, they're all coming out of poverty, you know, and people are coming, um, Israel, Israel um, Jews from all over are gathering in Israel. And you can imagine how it was to put an army together, but they did. So... 
the hope of 2,000 years is fulfilled, and right after they declared themselves as a nation, um, the five Arab countries invade them at once. But we can go into the miracles. Many miracles happened. But they um, overtook, they were victorious in the midst of, um, as for all of these Arab countries coming in, they won the battle in 1948 and it was miraculous indeed then in 1967 that was 1948 then in 1967 the uh, United States was preoccupied with Vietnam so the six day war was happening right during the time of Vietnam and it erupted in the Middle East when Egypt Jordan and Syria prepared to attack Israel in June of 1967. Three surrounding countries, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, all got around, they're all surrounding Israel, and attacked it in 1967. Israel responded with a lightning-quick preemptive attack, capturing the Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank of the Jordan, including Jerusalem and the Golan Heights of Syria. So Israel responded and defended herself, against three these three countries. Now, 1948, five countries attacked. Now, three countries are attacking. Israel's overwhelming victory humiliated the Arab nations who, who turned to the Soviet Union for more arms. So the Arabs are thinking, we need more um, military support. And so they were getting um, ammunition and guns and supplies and everything from the Soviet Union. The United States then sent weapons to strengthen the Israeli military to deter the future Arab attacks. So um, Israel did get support, a lot of support from the United States in our weapons. So here we have, again, a Cold War type situation, but now it's a war between the Arabs and the Jews, again, in Israel, you know, keeping its nation and its national status. But this is the Six Day War actually turned out um, magnificently for Israel. In fact, the Six Day War is they won Jerusalem. As you can see here, as they're looking towards Jerusalem, now they have their capital of Jerusalem. And needless to say, their Jerusalem was not even, you know, um, actually Israel was not even put on the map in some, in especially the Arab countries. You know, not even considered a nation to most, and now their capital being Jerusalem, and not until just recently, under President Trump, was their um, the capital of Jerusalem recognized as the, as Israel's capital. So, and we know what the Bible says about Jerusalem, you know, the cup of trembling, in Jerusalem, where you know our end time scenario happens where Jesus comes back and sits on the throne of David. But anyway, that's getting into your Bible. So here we have Israel in 1967 war. On to the Yom Kippur War. So October 6, 1973 now, Egypt and Syria now attack Israel again. Just Egypt and Syria. Um, the Arabs showed their hatred for the Jews by attacking the, on the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is their day of atonement, if you didn't know that. So this is their holiest day of the year. And so they're, cel they're celebrating in their, their holy day of the year, holiest day of the year, you know, as they're fasting and praying and, you know, the day of atonement. Um, the Arabs decide, well, this is a good time to attack, you know. So armed with new Soviet weapons, um, the Arabs appeared to be winning. So the Soviets actually gave weapons to the Arabs, and they appeared to be winning on the Yom Kippur. And then President Nixon arranged for emergency shipment of arms to Israel. Um, in the Yom Kippur War, Israel's, Israel drove the Egyptians back and prepared to invade Egypt. And um, Secretary of State Kissinger, under um, Nixon at that time, um, 
was worried that the invasion of Egypt would draw other Arab nations into the conflict. And then he was worried more, more than Israel, about Israel, he was worried about the oil supplies, that we would have a, a problem with oil supplies. Because whenever we supported Israel, the Arab nations would um, basically raise their prices on their oil to the United States, affecting us in, um, in um, our oil needs, especially um, gasoline prices, right? Um, so um, Kissinger got in the midst of this and he arranged a truce and the UN forces then were sent to patrol the border of Israel and Egypt and Egypt backed out. And actually it was a great, it was a great miracle uh, um, of this Yom Kippur War because it was so that Egypt had come in with all of their tanks, if you know the story, and um, basically um, uh, in the Golan, uh, up in the Golan Heights, um, Israel only had like a few tanks, hard, you know, like I can't remember how many, but very limited as I remember telling this story, maybe, you know, seven tanks at that time in that area. And they had the, all these tanks coming in. But what they did is one tank would go up towards one at a time, one tank would come up and then, then they'd go back around and another tank and they kept going around. So, so it looked as though Israel had many tanks. And so they thought, what is going on? So the Egyptian, the whole Egyptian army, which had totally outnumbered the Israel army, they got nervous thinking, man, they are, they are really equipped. And it became such like the Lord, it was like the Lord was showing how, oh, look at the vast armies here that Israel has. And basically um, scared them and they turned around and left. It's like crazy. You have to hear the stories of it. But anyway, um, the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Camp David Accords. So Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, then um, he achieved a success. If you had anything, anything uh, successful so far, Jimmy Carter didn't have many successes at all, right? But the Camp David Accords would be a good thing, you know, uh, for peace. So President Anwar Sadat, um, he lived 1918 to 1981 of Egypt, made a surprising proposal for peace with Israel in exchange for American economic aid. Hmm. So Sadat, he's thinking, you know, we'll have peace with Israel if Americans will come and help us. You know, needless to say, Egypt was not doing too well. So President Carter invited Sadat, you know, of Egypt and Prime Minister uh, Beijing. And he um, basically of Israel, he was the prime minister in Israel, Beijing of Israel, to a conference at Camp David in Maryland. So they came to Maryland. During the two weeks, President Carter worked tirelessly to mediate a deal between the two rivals, sometimes even as a go between because they would refuse to speak face to face. And so he would speak to one and then go into another room and speak to the other because they wouldn't even meet face to face at first. But Carter was trying to be a go between the two of them and try to work peace. As a result, Beijing and Sadat agreed to a framework of peace. So the three signed the Camp David Accords at a ceremony on the White House grounds in September of 1978. And for the first time in 2000 years, Jews and Arabs had negotiated a peace treaty. So uh, basically e between Egypt and Israel. Um, so Carter, he was relentless. He was going to get these guys to sign this peace treaty no matter what. Uh, and he did. So hmm, Camp David Accords, a good thing for the president, a good thing for America, and a good thing for peace in the Middle East for a very short time, I do say. Now trouble was going on in Lebanon. Lebanon's just north of um, Israel, you know, and uh, a lot of um, conflicts going on there. In 1958, the first test of the Eisenhower Doctrine was a crisis in the Middle East. And this crisis, this is 1958. So we're talking, you know, we were talking about Yom Kippur in 1973. Now we're going back to 1958. A rebellion occurred against the pro-West government in Lebanon. So the Lebanese, they had a government that was a dem uh, democracy that was um, very Western, like, all, like the United States. 
So there was a drive towards Arab unity um, that had climaxed with the Union of Egypt and Syria in 1958 to form the United Arab Republic, UAR, with Nassar as president. So Nasser is taking over Egypt. He's uniting now with Syria to form this United Arab Republic, taking over Syria. So not that good, as Nasser, we know, had a lot of communist ties, as we just found out. So the Arab nationalists seized power in Iraq, and the UAR sponsored a similar revolt in Lebanon. So these are Cold War communists. So the nationalists took power over in Iraq, then they went on to take, they were going to take over Lebanon, which Lebanon was a, a, a free enterprise capitalistic country at that time. And so we have um, Egypt and Syria forming the UAR together and going and uh, taking, um, basically nationalists already seizing power in Iraq. And now this all has to do with um, the Cold War communists coming in to take over Lebanon. So the Lebanese appealed to the United Nations and the United States for aid. 5,000 Marines were sent to Lebanon to protect American lives in Lebanon and to preserve the Lebanese independence. So we have another uprising. So now the uprising now is the communists have come in and just causing problems now um, in the midst of the Arab, you know, the Arab communities themselves, you know, and, and um, so to basically boot out any um, American or um, capitalistic um, governments and to overthrow them and make them into communist dictatorships. That's what they do. Well, that's what's going on in Lebanon. In the midst of all this, we have the OPEC, OPEC oil crisis. So what is this? Well, the Arab nations reacted to American aid to Israel in the Yom Kippur War by cutting off all oil exports to the United States. No, that's what Kissinger thought they'd do, right? And so as um, uh, Kissinger, the Secretary of State, tried to deal with the Yom Kippur War and make everything peaceful, it didn't happen that way. And basically, the Arab nations did say, okay, you guys get oil from us, we're going to raise our prices and we're going to cut off our oil exports to you and see what you do, right? Or see how you like it. So America had grown dependent on imported oil. The Arab oil embargo made oil scarce between 1973 to 1979, resulting in long lines at gas stations. The shipments of oil resumed in 1974, but the price was greatly increased by OPEC. What is OPEC? OPEC is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Country. Organization Petroleum Exporting Countries. They're all Arab nations. And they do have a monopoly on the world's oil. And they're designed, basically designed to control the supply and price of oil in the world. That was their, this is their business. So OPEC's policy helped to send, send um, the American economy, economy into a serious recession. So basically, um, because of them um, refraining from our oil or raising our prices on our oil that we got from them, we started to go into a recession in our economy. You can see here at the gas station, sorry, we're sold out. We're going to limit our speed limit now to 55 to see if we can save gas. Um, the oil prices are shocking now, shocking us. And here they are. Here's OPEC. They're all smiling and saying, yeah, this is what they're going to do. Here's a picture of the Arab, these Arab countries, some small in nature, but they have oil and they have a gun pointed at the United States saying, okay, we'll shoot you. No more oil. Hmm. So America turns over to the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. In 1975, Congress sought to lessen American dependence on the Middle East oil by permitting several large oil companies to build the 800-mile-long Trans-Alaskan Pipeline 
extending from the north slope to the south shore of Alaska. Vast amounts of oil had been discovered in northern Alaska in 1968, but environmentalists had prevented oil companies from obtaining government approval to develop the oil and to bring the, basically pipe the oil in. So the first oil was shipped from Alaska to California in 1977 via this pipeline. So now thinking, we got to get oil. We can't be getting oil from these Arab countries. They're going to be controlling us. And so now we have oil in Alaska. So basically the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline was developed during this time. Uh, and the oil was bring, coming in now um, for our needs from Alaska. But of course we have environmentalists saying, we don't want the oil, this is not good for our environment. But little to say, um, the oil was so vast there, it was kind of like God providing for us, right? On to the last thing we're going to talk about, and that's the Iran, Iran, Iran hostage crisis. So under Jimmy Carter, president again, the success at Camp David was overshadowed by another crisis in the Middle East. So this is what, when you look at, when you look at um, Jimmy Carter's pregnancy, you look at, this is the ugliest. So in 1979, a revolution in Iran depossessed the Shah, Muhammad Reza Pahlavi. And um, Pahlavi was basically, um, we call him the Shah. I don't even, I didn't even realize what his real name was, but he was the Shah of Iran. And he was a friend of the United States but Carter refused to aid him because the Shah had poor human rights record. You know, basically, you know, um, his, basically his human rights, he had problems in his country with human rights. And so basically Carter again says, you know, I'm not going to. And he was, he, he wasn't the greatest person, that's for sure. But on November 3rd, 1979, Iranian rebels under Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, Ayatollah, Ayatollah Khomeini is what I called him. That's what everybody, it's Ayatollah Khomeini, and he lived 1900 to 1989. He was a Muslim religious leader and an Islamist revolutionary. So he went in and captured the American embassy, and he took 66, 66 Americans hostage. This was the Iran hostage crisis. So um, basically... Ayatollah came out, he, he kicked up the government, you know, said, we're going to change the government to Islam, totally Islam. You know, um, uh, Muslims, you know, as a very, very um, religious leader and that bringing it into even what we have to today in Iran. But anyway, um, Iran basically, you know, um, in the midst of this, had taken these 66 Americans as hostage. Hmm. Here's a picture of him taking over and taking the Americans, burning the American flag. The Iran hostage crisis went on and on. So the Iran hostage crisis became the leading news story around the world for the next 14 months. Um, 14 hostages were eventually released but 52 still languished in captivity while news commentators counted the days. How many days in captivity? Carter, Jimmy Carter tried to negotiate with the terrorists um, using frozen Iranian assets for bargaining, but by April, public cry was so great in, in the United States, like you gotta do something, um, that he authorized a military rescue operation to happen. But mechanical difficulties during a sandstorm an accidental helicopter crash resulted in eight dying, eight Americans dying, and he was um, basically to discontinue the mission. He was uh, commanded to discontinue the whole mission. So here we have the helicopter crash. He had to discontinue. Eight Americans killed in Iran raid and the rescue, his rescue fails, fails. Did not even get in to Iran to be able to rescue um, these um, hostages. Carter's attempt was foiled, was basically um, 
he was it was he was considered it was disgraceful for him, right? With the military failure, Carter returned to negotiation, but uh, Khomeini, um, basically Ayatollah Khomeini, rejected each one of the president's offers, and knowing he was unlikely to attempt another military rescue. So the Ayatollah thought, ah, he's not going to try to come and rescue. He failed that time. He's not going to do it. So he said, nah, I'm not going to release, release the hostages. So by 1981, Carter put pressure on uh, Khomeini because he basically knew, you know, in 1980 that Iraq had invaded Iran and that Khomeini was now, you know, preoccupied with a, um, a war with Iraq. Iran in a war, they were in a war. And which um, increased Khomeini's need for money. So he thought, well, maybe this will be, hmm. So anyway, it wasn't until the presidential campaign of Ronald Reagan uh, was considered unlikely to give Khomeini a good deal or a deal at all. So basically what, he, what Carter was saying is like, eh, Khomeini, I know something. You're in a war right now with Iraq and you're gonna need money. And guess what? We have a president coming in to campaign, and he is not going to give you a good deal at all. He is not going to give you any money, and he's just going to come in, and he's going to bomb, bombard right into Iran. And so Khomeini, and looking at the next president coming on, that President Ronald Reagan is becoming president, and he's not going to take anything from um, any of um, the Ayatollah's dealings at all. And so um, so he decided, Kome decided to release the hostages, but only after Carter was out of office because he knew now Jimmy Carter was very weak. He felt him as a very weak person. He did not feel that Ronald Reagan would be weak. And so just minutes after Reagan was inaugurated as president on January 20th, uh, 1981, the hostages were released after 444 days of captivity. 444 days of captivity. The minute that Ronald Reagan takes president, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini says, okay, you can have your hostages. <laughs> he knew that, that what would happen next would not be good for uh, Iran. So anyway, see how politics, in the midst of politics, and it depends on who is president and what the policies are in foreign affairs. So I'm going to end this with a um, cold war here. And, and you can see how um, drastic these times and how upsetting these times and chaotic these times were. But in the midst of all this, we're going to see how um, God comes in and, um, and we look at Israel and we even look at the United States. And we're also going to see it's always going to be ongoing fights, isn't it? But we have to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus is the answer. When we look and pray, God does show up. So let's stop there.